good afternoon or good morning and welcome to Nature Day at the Water Pavilion if you're just joining us, where we're talking about nature-based solutions as uh, critical for climate adaptation and mitigation. Uh, our ne next session is nature-based solutions and climate change, harnessing the power of ecosystems for adaptation and mitigation. And to introduce you to the session, I have the pleasure of bringing in Kerry Davis, who's the technical director for the Alliance for uh, Global Water Adaptation. She's joining us online. Um, and so I'll pass the floor to you, Kerry. Great, thank you so much. Um, and before we get started, I'd like to thank all of the organizers of the Water Pavilion and of Nature Day itself. Today, I have the pleasure of moderating the session, which is convened by colleagues um, at the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, or BMZ, GIZ, the Inter-American Development Bank, United Nations Environmental Program, AGWA, the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation, and the International Water Management Institute, Groundwater Solutions Initiative for Policy and Practice, the Center for Sustainable Solutions and Practical Hydrology, Earth Trust, Middle Earth Water Forum, and the Ramsar Convention. Today's session, NBS and Climate Change, Harnessing the Power of Ecosystems for Adaptation and Mitigation, is very aptly held on Nature Day, seeks to highlight the importance of ecosystems for climate adaptation and mitigation and support the inclusion of nature-based solutions, or NBS, into naturally determined contributions and national adaptation plans. Today, you will hear from a variety of experts on how existing concepts in the water sector can be combined with ecosystem-based approaches to enhance climate resilience and mitigation efforts. Before I do though, I'd like to start, to first start with highlighting the multifaceted nature of nature-based solutions. Next slide, please. Great, thank you. So shown here on the screen is the International Union for Conservation of Nature's definition of nature-based solutions. Embedded in this definition is the ability to address multiple benefits simultaneously, providing additional services or co-benefits. Nature-based solutions can be used to tackle major societal challenges, such as water security, climate change, biodiversity loss, and human health jointly and coherently, contributing to achieving various sustainable development goals and NDCs. There are also very flexible solutions, allowing for adaptability to uncertain future conditions. Next slide, please. So the conveners of this session structure nature-based solutions into five categories, protection, management, restoration, infrastructure, and issue specific. All the partaking institutions here have implemented activities in multiple regional society and environmental settings throughout these categories. Here, nature-based solutions can either be used alone as purely green infrastructure or combined with more traditional gray infrastructure to form a more hybrid approach to support water management, climate change, and biodiversity goals. This image, also from IUCN, gives examples of these many types and how they can be used simultaneously within one system. Next slide, please. So before we jump into the session itself, I'm going to go through the agenda. We have a very great and diverse program outlined today. We will first start with a keynote that highlighting the policy perspective and what that means for a nature-based solution implementation. Following that keynote, you'll hear about how NBS can be integrated into existing water management techniques, such as the integrated basin management, wastewater treatment, and groundwater management. We will also share examples and lessons from Bolivia and the Dominican Republic, and then move into a diverse panel discussion on the critical role groundwater plays for water management and biodiversity. We will then close this session with a synthesis and call to action for nature-based solution rollout and scale up to collectively address climate diversity challenges. So before passing it over for our keynote, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Brigitte Pickel is the Director of Global Health, Pandemic Preparedness, and One Health at the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, or BMZ. She has more than 20 years of experience in international cooperation, including 12 years in management positions. She has lived and worked in West and Southern Africa on themes such as global health, pandemic preparedness, one health, water and sanitation, and biodiversity, as well as civil society, civic engagement, and international volunteering. She is also currently a member of the Board of Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, the Trust Fund for, Glen for Global Financing Facility, Chair Supervisor Board Legacy Landscape Fund. 
Brigitte, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can somebody unlock my video, please? Okay, great. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Kerry, uh, for handing over. Dear esteemed colleagues, dear participants on the Water Pavilion of the COP26 in Glasgow today, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to, to be here in this important session today. Ecosystems are heavily affected by climate change. Increased average temperatures cause heat waves and lead to water scarcity, drying out lakes and wetlands, as well as to raging forest fires. In addition, the increasing variability of precipita precipitation events are leading to flash floods and stronger monsoons. We've even seen it this summer here in Germany, just around the corner from where I live, inundating whole landscapes with disastrous consequences for human well-being and water quality. And yet ecosystems and not just the mere interface of these events. Ecosystems have the potential to limit the extent and impacts of climate change as they offer multiple opportunities for mitigation and adaptation. It is evident that we are already experiencing the impact of climate change on water on a global scale today. Therefore, the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ, which I represent, focuses on achieving water security and climate resilience through, for example, integrated water management approaches. In 2019 alone, we contributed more than 200 million euros in the water sector to adapt to climate change impacts, supporting integrated, flexible and robust solutions. In the field of flexible solutions, nature-based solutions are very important to achieve climate resilient urban sanitation. Water constantly remains one of the most important sectors within our ministry to limit climate change impacts and also um, in the work of other important partners, whether they be bilateral or multilateral. The ongoing water crisis and the rapidly progressing climate change are among the severest drivers of biodiversity loss not only through global warming and rising water temperatures, but also through the rise of sea level and ocean acidification. Most species populations live in or along freshwater ecosystems. 84% of these species have already been lost. On a global scale, 150 species vanish daily. Water availability and quality define to a great extent the extent of species habitat and its viability. Just a few, few, few weeks ago, the first session of the COP15 on the Convention on Biological Diversity, the CBD, took place. The proposed new framework explicitly aims at those synergies between climate change and addressing the loss of biodiversity. Germany, together with the EU and its member states, promotes and supports this ambitious new framework that reflects the interdependence of climate change and biodiversity loss and explicitly refers to nature-based solutions. The upcoming negotiations of the CBD are of enormous importance. We need a Paris moment for biodiversity. In 2021, BMZ is investing over 600 million euros, 50% more than in former years, globally in the protection, sustainable use and restoration of ecosystems. We support over 660 protected areas with an area of six times the size of Germany already, and we hope to be able to do more in the future. We all know intact ecosystems and biodiversity are not only key to ensure the well being and climate resilience of communities, but they can also provide important solutions for the mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions. Whilst forests are the lungs of our planet, wetlands may be considered as Earth's kidneys. With the highest mitigation potential of all ecosystems, they filter water and recycle nutrients. Storing more carbon than any other ecosystem, wetlands ought to be an integral part of the NDCs. But half of our natural wetlands have been lost globally in the past century. Intact wetlands have the potential to boost climate resilience by buffering floods, droughts and landslides, amongst other services. Peatlands store twice as much carbon as the Earth's forests. This means 
water, biodiversity and climate change are inextricably linked. Thus, limiting global warming ensures a habitable climate and conserves biodiversity. So what needs to be done? Providing an adequate global framework on biodiversity on a multilateral level for a whole of government and whole of society approach is important. The suggested changes must go hand in hand with urgent and significant action on the ground. And I'm happy that we'll hear some good examples later on. Let me give you some examples of action on the ground that we are already supporting. In Zambia, for instance, the EU co-finance project AWARE, which strengthens drought-affected farmers with climate-sensitive water resource management approaches. A set of identified measures on the watershed scale increases local water availability and stabilizes groundwater levels in the wider Kafue River system, on which 4.5 million people depend, with co-benefits for biological biodiversity. Diversity, sorry. Here, nature-based solutions at a landscape scale constitute powerful actions to tackle the twin challenge of climate change and biodiversity loss. Especially in the context of climate change mitigation and adaptation, nature-based solutions can address crucial water-related challenges such as water security and disaster risk reduction. When implementing nature-based solutions, we must follow a holistic approach. To balance trade-offs between economic constraints, climate change objectives, biodiversity conservation, and social welfare, nature-based solutions must come with sound social and environmental safeguards. Implementing NBS means that indigenous people and local communities must be included as strategic partners. For example, in Indonesia, the BMZ-funded project Propeat supports mitigation with green and blue carbon stocks of peatlands and mangroves through a multi-stakeholder dialogue process, thus promoting livelihoods through ecotourism and sustainable agriculture and farming at the same time. Nature-based solutions or ecosystem-based approaches can therefore create important synergies and achieve multiple benefits by bridging the Rio Convention and the 2030 Agenda, especially interlinking SDGs 6, 13, 14 and 15. Germany and BMZ remain clearly committed and place a growing emphasis on the use of nature-based solutions. To, ful to fulfill our promise of water for climate, we need to harness the power of ecosystems for climate resilience, biodiversity conservation, and contribute to climate change mitigation. Before I close, let me thank the Consortium of Conveners for organizing this important session, which is timely, forward-looking, and just necessary. I look forward to the cross-sectoral exchange among professionals tackling the triple challenge in the field of water, climate, and biodiversity in an integrated manner. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for that very informative keynote. Um, one thing very important here to highlight, and you said is that nature-based solutions are really more than just nature. They really transcend different sectors and, and goals from biodiversity to climate change, to livelihoods, um, and even more. And it really requires this whole government approach that you, that you spoke of. So we'll now shift from the policy perspective to the landscape perspective. And this image here, you will see it throughout, throughout this session, but as we transition um, from presentation to presentation and ask a different, different, different aspects of NBS, you will see this image fill in with different, um, different icons. So be aware of that. NBS have been tested in different parts of the world and they provided successful success in addressing both environmental and social needs. But nevertheless, the implementation of nature-based solutions remains small scale and sparsely distributed. How can NBS be mainstream and institutionalized? The following video makes the case for planning and participation process that allow people to integrate nature-based solutions in water management plans. The approach is not only technocratic. The value of water for communities is the base for the conceptual design of policies and the precipitation of different stakeholders is the value added to the implementation of these policies. GIZ will now share its experience in Bolivia.
América. Es un país diverso, tanto en el ámbito cultural como en su geografía. Abarca diversos ecosistemas, desde los Andes y los Valles hasta los Llanos, Tropicales y la Amazonía. Nosotros los pueblos indígenas vivimos en esta relación constante con... No creo que podamos ver el video. Podemos escucharlo, pero creo que necesitas transicionar tu screen para que podamos ver el video. Yeah, right now, right now it is the PowerPoint slide. It still looks to be the, the PowerPoint slide. Yeah, now, now it is just a black box, um, but we can see your mouse moving around. Um, hey, this is Nathan. I believe you need to go to share your screen again. It still looks to be the, the PowerPoint slide. Um, and just don't check the box that says optimize for video. And let's try that. Bolivia, corazón de... Is this a link right here, the, the words? I think making sure to just share the whole screen, not just the um, the tab or the application too. Yes, that could definitely definitely be it. Ah, perfect. Yeah. Bolivia, corazón de Sudamérica, es un país diverso tanto en el ámbito cultural como en su geografía. Abarca diversos ecosistemas, desde los Andes y los Valles hasta los Llanos, Tropicales y la Amazonía. Nosotros los pueblos indígenas vivimos en esta relación constante con la naturaleza, ¿no? y, y es parte de nosotros, nosotros somos parte de él. Esta relación es bien recíproca, porque si no fuese así recíproca, entonces ni yo mismo como sujeto, como ser humano, tendría vida. ¿no? El agua es el elemento articulador, es el elemento eh, que genera una dinámica, una serie de interacciones, tanto sociales, económicas y culturales, dentro de un espacio. Y este espacio, eh, ya en la política, para nosotros es la cuenca. Bolivia está entre los 20 países más vulnerables al cambio climático a nivel global. Los fenómenos meteorológicos extremos se han intensificado en los últimos años, presentándose inundaciones y riadas, sequía y extensos incendios forestales. La contaminación, los incendios y la sobreexplotación de recursos son amenazas adicionales que ponen a los ecosistemas en peligro. Aproximadamente el 40% de las cuencas en Bolivia muestra niveles de degradación ambiental de altos a moderados. Bueno, los ecosistemas están reconocidos en la Ley 300 de la Madre Tierra como zonas de vida. Las zonas de vida eh, albergan diferentes componentes de la Madre Tierra, como son los árboles, los bosques, los animales, el agua, todo, todo elemento biofísico que está presente, en este caso en una cuenca son los que eh, garantizan, por ejemplo, la disponibilidad de agua a partir de la infiltración en las cuencas altas. Por otro lado, también los humedales eh, son reservorios de, de agua para 
y que eh, las personas puedan utilizar en diferentes usos. Por tanto, es muy importante eh, la conservación de estos ecosistemas a partir de un manejo, en nuestro caso manejo integral de cuencas, donde están diferentes ecosistemas identificados y a partir de este manejo es que se puede garantizar la disponibilidad de agua para diferentes usos, en este caso agua potable, eh, para la producción, etc. Se ha puesto prioridad a partir del sector del agua, han puesto prioridades. Una de las que nosotros hemos identificado como APMT es la recuperación de los ojos de agua, sistemas de adaptación que en función a ese entorno, digamos, recuperación de bosques nativos, andinos, bofedales, que vayan jalando la la mantenga y contengan la humedad y el agua, las cosechas de agua y más que todo una mejor administración de este sistema, de, de, de este sistema de vida, ¿no? del, del agua. Entonces se, se ha ido contemplando eso, eh, casi todos los aspectos, ¿no? a partir de ese sector. La implementación de estos enfoques de política necesita cada vez mayores inversiones, tomar decisiones respecto a inversiones en un contexto de incertidumbre en cuanto al clima futuro puede ser un gran desafío. La gestión integrada de recursos hídricos provee un marco ideal para analizar opciones, discutir los beneficios y tomar decisiones de manera participativa e informada. Estamos desarrollando el proyecto por Cuenca, proyecto gestión integral con enfoque de Cuenca. En este proyecto estamos tratando de fortalecer el intercambio tanto de nivel nacional como de nivel subnacional y también con la sociedad civil para fortalecer la gestión hídrica y la seguridad hídrica en el país donde estamos apoyando tanto en sistemas de información para la toma de decisiones como en el desarrollo de capacidades y en el desarrollo de la política hídrica para construir plataformas de intercambio entre la población, el sector privado, la sociedad civil y los gobiernos del país. El proyecto fortalece las capacidades de las comunidades locales para la implementación de soluciones basadas en sistemas de vida, en los ámbitos de la ganadería, la agricultura y el desarrollo urbano. La agricultura orgánica, el manejo de viveros forestales y la reforestación de las cabeceras de cuenca, entre otros, son una oportunidad para desarrollar la adaptación de los sistemas productivos al cambio climático. Así, se promueve también la conservación de la naturaleza y la biodiversidad. Se disminuyen las emisiones de carbono, se protegen las principales fuentes hídricas y se reduce la deforestación, con un potencial efecto multiplicador a nivel regional y nacional. Contar con agua segura, en cantidad y calidad para todos los usos requiere el esfuerzo y compromiso de los habitantes de las cuencas y de sus instituciones. Con este fin, se han creado plataformas interinstitucionales en las cuencas del río Guadalquivir y del río Acero como espacios de coordinación, concertación y diálogo. Las plataformas han elevado planes directores de cuenca mismos que reflejan el valor del agua y los ecosistemas para la población y presentan soluciones basadas en sistemas de vida, incluyendo la protección de las fuentes de agua, de las riberas, de los ríos y de los acuíferos. Sumando esfuerzos con la cooperación internacional, gobiernos locales, organizaciones productivas, pueblos indígenas, sector privado, academia y otros sectores, podemos lograr cambios importantes para hacer frente a los desafíos de las regiones y fortalecer la capacidad de resiliencia y adaptación transitando hacia un modelo de desarrollo armónico con el medio ambiente. Sumando esfuerzos, protegemos nuestros recursos naturales para la convivencia en armonía y desarrollo. Great. I hope you enjoyed that video. The video really highlighted how 
IWRM can be used to advance nature-based solution implementation and provide water security and climate change benefits. It also includes this holistic approach that was brought up in the keynote here. I will leave you some final thoughts to reflect on. Protecting nature, natural resources to live in harmony and development. This final message of the video asks us to reflect on the following points, and I encourage you to think about them through the rest of this presentation, as well as the rest of the conference over the next two weeks. Why are we actually choosing nature-based solutions? Why do we expect its outcomes? Are the most vulnerable communities really benefiting from nature-based solutions, or are we just proposing nice plans? Really think about these thoughts as you go on with your work. We'll now shift from the landscape perspective to the city's biodiversity aspect and hear about nature-based solutions for wastewater treatment in the Dominican Republic. I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Uber Cardoza Villalobos is a civil engineer from the University of Costa Rica and holds a Master of Science in Material Sciences and Engineering from Mastar Institute in Abu Dhabi in cooperation with MIT. Uber has more than 10 years of experience in projects aimed at reducing environmental impacts of rivers, as well as research and development experience in the field of introducing sustainable energy storage solutions. He joined GIZ as an advisor for the Crew Plus program in the middle of October, 2021. He is passionate about innovation and sustainability and always looking for opportunities to reduce the carbon footprint of the environment and promote the circular economy. Uver, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Well, good morning and good afternoon for everyone in, in Glasgow. Um, as she said, my name is Uber Villalobos. I'm a technical advisor for GIZ here in Costa Rica. We are honored here to, to share with you the highlights of a small project that has huge impact for a lot of people back in Dominican Republic. We would like to explore today the actions for climate change mitigation and adaptation at a sanitation facility at the Dominican Republic. So our agenda will be to address a, a brief description of the Sanitation for Millions program, um, the context of the GEF Crew Plus low-tech sanitation solution in the Dominican Republic, a description of the intervention area in this case, um, the current situation of the wastewater treatment plant, the solution proposed for the this water, wastewater treatment plant, the ways we propose to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions and a way to increase the availability of water, water at a local level. Next slide, please. Well, the Sanitation for Millions program um, is a multi-donor program, which was set by the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development to improve the access to safe and adequate sanitation. It was launched back in 2016 and operates worldwide in 14 countries, executed by the GSZ. The program focuses on the needs of vulnerable groups such as children, women and girls, refugees and internally displaced people, and as well as people with disabilities and indigenous communities. In our case, in the wider Caribbean region, Sanitation for Millions executes activities on behalf of the Inter-American Development Bank within the GEF funded project called Crew Plus. This small-scale small solution that I will address today is part of this project, Crew Plus. Next slide, please. First, I would like to address the context in the Dominican Republic. We have a situation in which several wastewater treatment plants are abandoned due to lack of maintenance and resources, which has happened for decades. All this untreated wastewater has been discharged to the rivers which could affect the health of the population and also of the environment. There is also a release of gases to the atmosphere, which contributes to the effect of global warming. Therefore, we have the challenge to reduce the impact of the untreated wastewater and its byproducts to the environment. Our objective is to achieve an adequate operation of the existing wastewater treatment plant to protect the public and the environmental health, preserve the hydrobiological quality of aquatic ecosystems, and comply with current legislation for wastewater discharge. Next slide. Now we're going to watch a small, a small video of the Minister of Environment and Natural Resources, Silmer Gonzalez.
la República Dominicana. afectan nuestra zona costera y afectando la vida acuática. Es por ello que el gobierno de la República Dominicana ha implementado en su agenda nacional proyectos, programas y medidas para mitigar el cambio climático. Este proyecto La República Dominicana enfrenta grandes retos asociados al cambio climático, tales como sequías prolongadas en la zona sur de nuestro país afectando plantaciones agrícolas y el manejo inadecuado de aguas residuales que afectan nuestra zona costera y afectando la vida acuática. Es por ello que el gobierno de la República Dominicana ha implementado en su agenda nacional proyectos, programas y medidas para mitigar el cambio climático. Este proyecto CRUMAS viene a reforzar nuestra agenda nacional. La finalidad del proyecto es utilizar el agua residual después de tratada en nuestros campos agrícolas para combatir las prolongada sequía en esta zona y evitando a la vez que el agua no tratada afecte nuestra vida acuática. Otro factor importante es que el contenido de nitrógeno y fósforo que puede ser utilizado colabora con el crecimiento de las plantaciones. Es por esto que el proyecto CRUMAS viene a ser parte de las medidas de adaptación al cambio climático para la República Dominicana. Now we're going to focus on the intervention area of this project. We're going to focus on the Autonomous University of Santo Domingo, which is the public, the, mo the main public university in the Dominican Republic, with 19 campuses around the, around the country. The, the campus we're focused on is located in the city of Santiago de los Caballeros, where thousands of people go to work and study every year. The wastewater from the university right now is discharged to the stream that eventually connects to the river called Yaque del Norte, which is the longest river in the Dominican Republic and affects urban areas along the way. Next slide. I'm going to watch a video from Zacarias Navarro of the Autonomous University of Santo Domingo. En la República Dominicana, el proyecto CREO está apoyando la rehabilitación de la planta de tratamiento de aguas residuales de la Universidad Autónoma de Santo Domingo, ubicada en la provincia de Santiago de los Caballeros, la cual actualmente está funcionando de manera eh, inadecuada, ineficiente. El proyecto contempla esa rehabilitación, la construcción de un medio artificial, la capacitación del personal técnico la sensibilización de las autoridades. De ser posible, queremos aprovechar las aguas residuales luego de tratada y el biogás generado. Además, con esto se reducen los costos y se evita el impacto al aire, al agua, directamente al suelo. 
y las enfermedades que puedan venir de aguas residuales en el área de influencia. El proyecto además permitirá que la Facultad de Ingeniería y Arquitectura establezca la planta de tratamiento como un laboratorio para realizar investigaciones y docencia. Well, the current wastewater treatment system at the university is, has been abandoned for a lot of, lot of years since it is construction in 2005. The plant consists of a primary treatment with screens in a grid chamber and an upflow anaerobic sludge blanket or UASB with a, an upflow anaerobic filter. With no operation and maintenance of the plant, there are a lot of issues. For example, the wastewater is discharged to the stream the sludge is not treated or, or discharged properly, and there is a constant release of methane to the atmosphere. Next slide. So our proposed solution consists of a lot of things, actually. Um, we decided that the system requires many improvements, as well as, a, as well as a good coordination among the different actors. We also encourage the reuse of the byproducts of the treatment process, so it can be used for other applications promoting the circular economy. So in this case, we're promote, promoting the use of biogas in a torch, but eventually we can use it for, for a cogeneration for the plant. Also, the, for the discharge, we, use, we can use natural mangroves, so we can even improve the, the quality of the water discharged to the river. So firstly, we have to improve the, the whole system. Most of the design still complies with the requirements, but it needs many improvements. We are proposing to use the effluent for irrigation purposes to reduce the pressure on the water resources. We, to manage responsibly the biogas, we need the installation of a collection system and a torch. Also, we need a, a sludge collection system as well as a drying beds to properly manage it. And furthermore, we can use the sludge for agricultural purposes such as compost. Next slide. So right now, talking specifically of the UASB, there's a constant release of greenhouses, greenhouse effect gases to the atmosphere, to the chimney, and to the leads, and from the leads of the reactor. We're estimating an amount of 13 tons of methane released each year, which is equivalent to 364 tons of CO2. The reactor itself has a poor retention of biomass, which could compromise the growth of sludge inside the reactor. Finally, there isn't, there isn't a proper distribution of wastewater inside the reactor to obtain, to obtain a proper mixture of substrate and biomass. All these problems, actually, we see them as opportunities so we can improve the system. So for example, we propose the replacement of the leads of the reactor to avoid the release of methane in an hermetic way, but also they have to be light enough so they can facilitate the operation and maintenance of the system. For the distribution system, we're exploring other options such as distribution, a distribution box with radial flow. The idea is to have a symmetric distribution box combined with weirs to uniformly distribute the affluent. Next slide. In the case of the anaerobic filter, there's a lot of issues to, to fix again. Uh, according to our calculations, the anaerobic filter is capable enough to reduce the amount of organic material and solids from the effluent of the UASB. However, the lack of maintenance promoted the growth of vegetation in the, on the packing material, as you can see, and the release of odors and methane to the environment. So as a solution, we propose to cover the top of the anaerobic filter to avoid the release of methane and replace the piping system, which has been fully deterior deteriorated for, for years. Also, there must be a mechanism to clean the sludge from the bottom of the filter for its proper disposal. Next slide. One final issue is the abandoned pumping station, which was designed to discharge the treated water. Right now, there isn't any discharge, discharge pipe or uh, pumping equipment for this task. So considering the increase of flow in the future, we need a new pump, a new pipeline. And we also expect that the effluent to have the quality of a type C 
for type C reuse application, which is for irrigation for industrial and forage cereal crops, grasslands, and trees. This will be a great way to reduce the impact on the river and bring value to the local farmers, promoting the circular economy. Now, we have talked a lot about the technical aspects, but there has to be complemented with a proper engagement of the interested parties and a sustainable financial model. There must be a commitment from the authorities and institutions to operate and maintain the wastewater treatment plant and keep doing it during the lifetime of the project. We are proposing also to use nature-based solutions such as mangroves, as I said before, at the outfall of the plant and the possibility to build a research facility for wastewater studies that could benefit the University of Santo Domingo. These small scale solutions are examples that could be scalable at the regional or national level, so we can further reduce our impact on the water resources. Next slide. I have to mention that this and many other projects are financed thanks to the GEF, IBD, and the UN. These resources are executed by a huge international team between the UNEP, GIZ, and the OAS, which make possible the further development of sanitation in the region. Finally, I would like to thank the Ministry of Environment of the Dominican Republic and the Autonomous University of Santo Domingo for their help, enthusiasm, and guidance, and PROMSA for all the cooperation during this study. Thank you all. Great. Thank you very much for that, that presentation. Um, it was very interesting to hear about what's happening on the ground um, and all these, these local efforts of nature-based solutions and hearing how nature-based solutions can be used to support sanitation goals. One thing here too that this presentation really highlighted is the multi-benefit aspect of nature-based solutions. While the primary focus was to support sanitation goals, there are also climate change mitigation benefits as well as for agriculture um, and other aspects as well. And the circular economy and, um, aspect was very interesting to hear about. This also highlighted um, how it really requires a coalition and local buy-in to advance these projects and that they are flexible and adaptable as in mangroves can be added after the project's completed. We'll now move um, underground to the groundwater. Groundwater is a critical dimension of nature-based solutions that is important for water storage. Karen Villahoth and Shami Puri will take us through a curated presentation and panel really dive into this topic. I'd like to introduce our speakers and our organizers for the next part of our session. Karen Villahoth is a principal researcher at the International Water Management Institute, or EMI, and chair of the Groundwater Solutions Initiative for Policy and Practice, a global partnership of 30 international organizations supporting sustainable development, use, and management of groundwater. Karen holds a PhD in hydrology and a master's in chemical engineering from the Technical University of Denmark and a master's in civil engineering from the University of Washington. She worked for DHI Water and Environment and Geo Geographical Sur Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland. She is editor of eight books and the special issues and editor of more than 80 peer reviewed international journal articles. Her co-convener for this piece is Shami Puri. Shami Puri is a practitioner in the sound governance of land water biodiversity and subsurface water. He has experience of over 40 years from programs conducted in over 35 countries with a cumulative investment reaching around 1 billion euros. That includes funding from international financing agencies, bilateral donors, and government's own investments. He's also trilingual in Polish, Spanish, and Hindi Punjabi. Karen and Shami, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Carrie, for this nice introduction. Um, I'm very pleased to be part of this session today to uh, sort of be able to integrate the aspects of what we call subsurface nature-based solutions, because I think there's a need to, to be discussing, of course, some, some sectors or some communities. And oftentimes we are like speaking to ourselves when we discuss what groundwater can do in this context. Um, but it's very important that we sort of you know, bring, um, bring these various contexts together. So uh, what Shami and I have put together for you today is a sort of um, kaleidoscopic introduction um, to really highlight what uh, groundwater can do for us in terms of supporting nature-based solutions and also to advocate for um, more explicit 
accounting for these uh, different uh, nature-based solutions and eco ecosystem services that groundwater can provide and making sure that they're accounted for explicitly. Next slide. So in my part of the section, we'll have a small panel where we'll be um, asking the questions of what um, are, how, how is groundwater being incorporated into, um, into different programs at the moment? And we'll hear both from, um, from global aspects, from the DEF, and we'll hear from Southern Africa, from the CASA TFCA, the uh, largest uh, transfrontier conservation area in the world. And we'll also hear from a national uh, department working on water in Southern Africa. Next slide, please. So when we're talking about uh, groundwater and nature-based solutions, it's very important to understand what the ecosystem services that groundwater provide. And I've just given here a few examples. So it's very clear how groundwater sort of fits into the whole scheme of things. And I think we all know there's water down there somewhere, but what happens is maybe not clear and uh, this is exactly what we focus on. We want to understand what's going on under the ground, how it links to ecosystems and how we can manage those uh, processes to the benefit of humans. So here you can see a, um, a both a terrestrial and a ter aquatic system that is benefiting from groundwater. Next slide. Here you can see from the top uh, how you can actually in inadvertently affect these um, ecosystem services from groundwater that could be, for instance, recharging a lake. If you pump close to that, you will, of course, interfere with that ecosystem service. So there's a very clear line between managing the groundwater and managing your ecosystem services that are based on groundwater. And this is something we, we really need to keep uh, into account. Next. When we look into the landscape, you will see these ecosystem services and, and, and environments um, pretty much all over the landscape. And here I just uh, encircled some of them. So they're very much linked to both aquatic and coastal systems. You even have systems underground, caves and so on, that have uh, very important um, ecosystems and, and biodiversity associated with them. So just for you to get an understanding that this is not something esoteric, it's basically all over the place. And if we undermine our groundwater and we don't you know, manage it well, we will also undermine many of these ecosystem services, for instance, the environmental flows that are linked to, um, to the groundwater discharging into rivers. N uh, next slide. In the GRIP network, we have been um, setting up this platform and uh, you're welcome to have a look at it next. You can uh, click one more time. At this uh, page, you will be able to further drill into what these um, ecosystem services are. And uh, we look at the very specific um, uh, natural infrastructure systems that you could put in place from groundwater. So we probably already heard about managed aquifer recharge or just MAR, but that's just one side of the thing. We can also talk about how we remediate our groundwater through natural systems. We can talk about how we remediate and um, reduce risks from floods and droughts by capturing water underground. And uh, there's many, many ways to, uh, to enhance uh, the ecosystem services from groundwater by doing this in a very explicit manner. Now I will go over to the small panel discussion we have, and I would like to hand over now to Dr. Nyambe Nyambe. Nyambe is working uh, as an executive secretary of the CASA Secretariat in Southern Africa, where he's overseeing a 520,000 square kilometer area that is under various levels of protection. And uh, just over to you, Niambe, to understand how you're incorporating groundwater into your programs on transboundary issues. Uh, thank you very much, Karin, and uh, the honor to be here. Hope you can hear me clearly. Um, and apologies, I'm phoning in from uh, my car. Uh, I'm on the road. But quickly, just to acknowledge that uh, we cannot talk about nature-based solutions in the context of the area that I work in, the Kavango Zambes Transfrontier Conservation Area, without acknowledging the importance of environmental flows, hydrological connectivity, and uh, uh, basically also the need to address the various water risks that we face, including climate change. And uh, from where we stand, 
as an area which is located between two river basins, the Okavango and the Zambezi River Basin, both of which are uh, predicted to be very highly impacted by effects of climate change, the need to look at fresh water in general and groundwater in particular is very, very critical. Now, why is it? Is this the case? I would like to first mention that in our particular case, as a secretariat, we do not implement. So the role that we are playing is that of a convener, bringing different parties to the table to discuss freshwater risks in our landscape. Uh, we, have, we have also recently uh, been working on uh, a transboundary diagnostic assessment to understand one part of the uh, TFCA or the landscape so that we can probably scale up and uh, work in the other parts of the landscape in the near future. And to do this, one of the central tenets of our work really is uh, governance, transboundary governance. And we work with the two river basin organizations, the Okavango uh, Water Coast Commission and the Zambezi Water Coast Commission, realizing that these are the two mandated entities to manage uh, water resources in the respective river basins. And like I said earlier, we are working in an area that is between two river basins. So for us, governance, transboundary governance, how we work with everybody, because water is everybody's business, private sector, NGOs, researchers, cooperating partners, we have been playing the role of a convener and identified different projects for implementation. Thank you. Your mic is muted. Karen, you are muted. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you. So, um, I would like to now hand over to Astrid Hillers from the DEF and basically asking you the same question in terms of your programs uh, where you're working on transboundary freshwater systems across the globe. How are you incorporating groundwater into your programs on transboundary resilience? Thank you, Karen. Thank you for being here. Groundwater in the GF portfolio over the last recent uh, cycles have increased in awareness, which is great to see. And we have seen more countries and more projects that ask for support. We have seen, though, that cooperation on shared aquifers, though it is, of, is often slower, though, to come about, even when there were based organizations existing in the same area as, as Nyambi talked about, it does take more knowledge to know what's the impact of one country to another. You don't know what the flows are. It's not so obvious, right? It's groundwater. You don't know what the amounts are. You don't know where the recharge are. So the, the lack of knowledge makes it a bit slower for countries to engage. Interesting though, these in amorphous issues on the groundwater and not so well understood, I think for me have two lessons that we have learned there. The governance lags behind because Countries perceive as it has plenty, groundwater is just there until it isn't. Um, and so it's less regulated. On the other hand, for cooperation, the lack of knowledge makes dialogue and common fact finding somewhat less controversial, at least in areas where the groundwater is not heavily depleted yet. This is not a universal thing. This is just in certain circumstances, but it's interesting. So we see now more projects coming about so what is the nature of support requested for countries? First, you cannot manage what you, can, uh, what you cannot measure. So the first and foremost comes information, in improvement, assessments, observation wells, models, et cetera. That's the dominant and first issue that is being requested by countries. Second, governance, and Yambe talked about that. The institutional arrangements on shared aquifers are still rare and mostly not formalized. There's a growing interest though emerging to look also at conjunctive uses between the groundwater and managed river basins and the management of river basins. Third, innovative investments. So there is where nature-based solutions have a great potential to hold. You talked about managed aquifer research and underground storage of water. 
which is much more resilient and less has less evaporation. Uh, so could that be increased and more used as a measure of drought resilience for different uses? In the simplest sense, we see managed aquifer recharge used in watershed management. And there are some waterfronts not on transboundary scale yet on, on looking at payment for ecosystem services. So in future, could that even be expanded to look at high value users like cities paying farmers not to farm, not to irrigate, but use the fields for infiltration? There are some examples in Japan where that is already happening. Is that something one could build on? Uh, we use, with water scarcity increasing, a reuse infiltration of treated wastewater will have to probably increase massively to, to, to deal with water security and water scarcity. Flood protection, you managed that before two controlled flooding areas. We see that, especially also in the U European trained rivers and the Danube and so forth, letting water flood recharge in the aquifer at the same times. Similar on uh, coastal protection, mangroves, wetlands that, that take away flood peaks and, and act as sponges for holding up the water and infiltrate. Um, stream flow, pro groundwater providing base flow. It is my, one driver for the corporation integrated management surface and groundwater river basins. Could nature-based solutions be more consciously added in there to maintain environmental flows? Last thing I want to mention, groundwater quality. It's a huge issue in rising in, 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 our, uh, in our environment. It's Prevention is the first defense there. It's very expensive to clean up, but bioremediation and tweaking the subsurface condition for degradation could certainly much more increase and hopefully we can scale that up. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much, Astrid, for all these uh, potential and also actually implemented solution. And I think it's very important to say also here that uh, these are not, um, you know, blue sky thinking. Uh, there's actually a lot of, of things happening in the space and, and a lot of experience is now being captured. So I really encourage you to have a look at the GRIP website, which will give you a good entry point to learn more about this. Now, the last uh, panelist that I would like to call upon is uh, Tefo Lobello. Tefo Lobello is the regional manager for the Department of Water and Sanitation in Botswana. And uh, I would like to understand a little from you, uh, Tefo, how you are sort of uh, engaging on, on MAR at the moment and, and how you see this uh, coming into the water security and resilience plans in Botswana. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, Ma is a relatively new concept here in Botswana. We have currently, as a government, uh, through the World Bank, managed to source funding through the Botswana Emergency Water Security and Efficiency Program. And we are currently doing a study on how we can recharge our aquifers. Primarily, we've chosen the Pala Road aquifer, just some kilometers, some 50 kilometers outside of Mahalape. We disconnected uh, the entire scheme from the main North South Korea program. And then we, we injected, we drilled some boreholes there and then test pumped them and re injected the water from the scheme into the borehole so that we could check if uh, the, 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 the program will work. In terms of benefits of, of, of the program, uh, uh, they may be realized in term. As uh, we all know that uh, Botswana <coughs> is an arid region with very little rainfall and, and high evaporation rates, this scheme would, would, would inadvertently help in the storage of water that would otherwise would have evaporated naturally from the from the uh, from the dams. <coughs> and uh, since the water supply uh, 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 also in Botswana uh, uh, is very scarce and the the, the, the water in, in, in the dams easily evaporates. And we have this slogan of Sumar Latut, where we want to conserve the little water that we have. So we are inadvertently trying to, to conserve that through that program. In terms of the number of people that uh, we, we would want uh, to benefit from this, this concept, uh, primarily the eastern side of the country is where uh, most of the economy is happening, but uh, and also most of the dams that supply the, 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 the country uh, are on that side. So uh, we, 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 we are st still piloting that program on that side, on the Eastern side, where we will uh, uh, safely say more than 50% of the people who would benefit 
more than 50% of the population uh, would be the, the people benefiting uh, uh, from that program. Uh, in terms of the uptake of this uh, of the scheme in the region, there are a few region, uh, uh, regional projects that have been ongoing for quite some time, of course, especially uh, in countries that are, uh, are surrounding us, especially in, in Namibia, on the home there. We also have the Langyaban Road Scheme Aquifer, where uh, they are currently injecting uh, uh, into the pipeline from the boreholes. We have the Kolamela mine in South Africa as well. And all these programs, projects that I'm, uh, uh, schemes that I'm mentioning, we are also in preparation of visiting them in the next uh, uh, two weeks or so to try and see uh, the challenges and appreciate how we can learn uh, 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 or have some lessons learned from them so that we can implement those in, 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 in what we are trying to do. Uh, I think, uh, in, I think in I a nutshell, that is primarily yeah. what we would want as a, as a government. Yeah. But it has been proven that it, it works in, 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 in other parts of the world, in, in, in yeah. Australia, in, in the United States. It's there. So we would also want uh, to, 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 to implement it in our country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tefo, for this uh, really exciting history from, you know, on the ground. We are running a bit behind, so I will not take more time and I'll go straight uh, to hand uh, over to Shami to uh, give his uh, part of this uh, section. Thanks. Um, well, thank you very much indeed, Karen. Uh, let me see if I can make this wonderful gizmo work. Uh, I'm not an expert at it, but uh, let's see if it actually works. Can you see my PowerPoint? Please say yes, someone. Yes, yes, we can. You, can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, but it is it is not full screen. So I do not know if you want to make it full screen. Uh, I've got it full screen on my, my end. We, we can see it from this side. Okay, well, let's go with this. So, my name is uh, Shami Puri, and I'm the director of a think tank, which is called... Shami, we cannot see the video right now. Using practical we can hear it, but we can't see it. Uh, I have used the um, share screen, which tells me to click the video. Yeah, I've got the share screen, share sound, uh, selected. Is that working? Try again. We, uh, we, can, to, to... we can see your PowerPoint, but not the video. Oh, we tried that earlier on. Oh, there My we go. Name Perfect. Is, uh, Shami Puri, great. And I'm okay. the director of a think tank. Is it working? Yes, it is working. Which is called Sustainable Solutions Using Practical Hydrogeology. Well, these Techno gizmos don't really work. Sorry about that. But anyway, this is our presentation. Let me just move through it fairly. What we would like to say is that the interface between land, water, and biodiversity, uh, there is groundwater, and it's the underlying resource which pins together these three elements. So by creating and enhancing these kind of conditions, such as the lake behind me and in other areas where there is groundwater, we can enhance the biodiversity, we can enhance the interface between land and water and the biodiversity that I was talking about. So uh, we're hoping that in this session there's several questions that you might have. Some of them are posted over there and we're hoping that uh, as a result of listening to us you will get an understanding of what it is we're trying to propose. The way I will present these, this part of the presentation is by giving you several examples. So we will have an example from the Thames Valley in Oxfordshire, uh, where we've got some ponds, wetlands and backwaters constructed. Then we'll move to the arid zones of Baluchistan and see what the similarities are. Similarities in the sense of the issues and how they're addressed, looking at nature-based solutions. We will then move to Morocco, and then we will look at how these issue, issues are addressed broadly in the MENA region. So let's start with the Thames Valley. 
Hello Ian, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi Shami, yes, my name's Ian Nutt and I'm the Director of Programmes and Partnerships at the Earth Trust. Um, how does the Earth Trust work on environment and water management? So it's really interesting at the Earth Trust we have um, 1,200 acres of land, some of which you can see behind us and which we're standing on, which is a mixed farm. So we have um, arable, we have a large amount of um, forestry, and you can just see behind us a stretch of the Thames from the completely wet. Sorry about that. <clears throat> that that's very interesting. So, um, if we're looking at climate change um, and climate adaptation to climate change, um, these ponds are presumably going to help us to adapt to climatic changes. How do you think that's going to function? What, what are the key requirements to make sure that these things help to adapt to climate change. It's really important that features like this that we're putting in are part of the functioning landscape around us. So you can see behind us that there is very little water within the landscape. And what we're doing is we're expanding that um, uh, surface area where water can take hold and where you can create those ecosystems and allow them to spread within the landscape. So at the moment we aren't in the flood season. Once the flooding does start to occur the extra ponds and backwaters that we've put in will allow the biodiversity to thrive and spill over and we get the real benefits, the ecosystem benefits from that rather than it just being a floodplain that floods onto poor quality agricultural land. So one of the things that I'm interested to learn from you is how do you see uh, the role of subsurface water, groundwater, because in among our considerations as water scientists, uh, in my profession we think groundwater is really important, very important. So how, how do you perceive that? Do you have some reasonable understandings of it or is it a, a unknown uh, science? Yeah, it is relatively unknown for those of us in the environmental charitable sector. It's not an area that we have a huge amount of insight and knowledge into, but we are hoping that the work that we've, we've done here on the floodplain and the other um, enhancements that we've put in around um, the backwater, so things like planting of trees, so significant tree planting, th whose root systems will help to improve the soil quality and we think and hope therefore the groundwater as well will all collectively work together, but we, we're waiting to see if that is the case. Okay. Uh, that's very interesting. If you wanted to send a message to the ministers who are meeting at the COP26 conference, they talk about emissions, what, what message would you like to send from the experience of the Earth Trust on the work that you've been doing? So if there was one message that we would send and we would like to put out to the ministers, it is for incentivization, policies, financial and otherwise projects that incentivize landowners to be able to implement more of the features that we know contribute towards uh, good eco-hydrology. So incentivization, that's the key word over there. And that's also the message that can be applied to governments in probably all landscapes around the planet. And when we apply it to some arid regions, such as Baluchistan, where we might seek to use nature-based solutions through the transformation into a no, low water economy, that's the, probably the way to go. So if we're looking at a landscape of this kind where there's a lack of water, and as a result of that, livelihoods are at risk, one of the things we can do is by looking at the geology, the hydrogeology, interpreting what's going on in the field, making some field observations of this kind, looking at the way people use the water resources available to them, looking at the way people are using the sparse resources that they have in this kind of region, helping them to better manage these resources and helping them to develop some kind of a new land management uh, through nature-based uh, solutions and by enhancing the land management, reaching consensus, reaching agreement so that their uh, uh, livelihoods can be guaranteed in the face of adaptation to the climate change. So the message from here is to adapt by consensus to nature-based solutions in a new governance paradigm 
of a low water use economy in this particular environment, perhaps through using mutual contractual means. So let's see how these new mutual contractual means might apply by looking at Morocco. Let me introduce some. So shortly I'm going to call on my colleague from Morocco to illustrate how in an arid zone this kind of issue is being addressed to make sure that the aquifers that are available over there are well managed and that they will provide the potential for uh, continuing economic sustainability. Good morning, everyone. I'm Afila Sharafat from Morocco. Uh, I'm an uh, expert in water resources. Uh, I have been working in the water sector for more than 25 years, starting as a young engineer in the drinking water office and national company in Morocco uh, managing uh, water sector and sanitation services where I held several responsibilities before uh, being appointed as a minister in charge of water in the Moroccan government from, from uh, 2013 to 2018. So let's ask um, Sharafat how they have applied this approach in Morocco through through the means of something called an aquifer contract. The aquifer contract is one of the social and technical innovations for climate change adaptation. It is a technical and financial non-bending agreement between stakeholders and the government. We consider this to be a nature-based solutions as it aims to ensure the sustainable mode of groundwater governance by setting up the rules and the requirements for all users. In this way, we can save the resources during the wet years and use it during the drought periods. In this way, we can enhance adaptation to climate change. This approach focuses on the following steps. First, we start by assessing the vulnerability and the risks to climate change. After that, we can move to implement specific and adaptive measures to enhance the storage capacity for the aquifer for use at times of stress. So that's an interesting way of looking at it. And how, uh, I was going to ask Charlotte, how is this actually applied? The aquifer contract is one of the social and technical innovations for climate change adaptation. It is a technical and financial non-bending agreement between stakeholders and the government. We consider this to be a nature-based solution as it aims to ensure the sustainable mode of groundwater governance by setting up the rules and the requirements for all users in this way we can save the resources during the wet years and use it during the drought periods. In this way, we can enhance adaptation to climate change. This approach focuses on the following steps. First, we start by assessing the vulnerability and the risks to climate change. After that, we can move to implement specific and adaptive measures to enhance the storage capacity for the aquifer for use at times of stress. The aquifer contract is one of the social and technical facing climate change in the water sector requires adaptive governance and a paradigm shift in water cycle management. So often policymakers are forced to make hard decisions by setting up drastic measures and restrictions that are difficult to be accepted by the communities. Those developing innovative social and technical solutions is crucial to undertake the change. The aquifer contract that has been tested in Morocco is considered one of the innovative solutions in the groundwater governance. This nature-based management tool ensures stakeholders' participation and accountability. Six, 
to bring all the stakeholders and all the parties on the table to be part of the decision. This mode of the governance of the management has shown conclusive results in Morocco and could be uh, as well uh, tested in the other parts of the MENA region. So that's an interesting way of looking at how we can complement some obligations together with some possibilities in which the community manages through a nature-based approach on their water resources. Uh, Sharf had mentioned the application to the whole of the MENA region. Let's see how it might apply in the MENA region. I'm Dr. Hassan Abu Naga, Vice Chair of the Middle East Water Forum. I'm very delighted and honored to join this session at COP26 with a clear message that we need to rethink groundwater for climate resilient development, especially in the Middle East, the most water scarce region in the world. So how is this going to be actually applied and how will conduct this? Groundwater aquifers like personal accounts become insolvent when withdrawals exceed the deposits. You can think of aquifers like retirement saving accounts, steady, slow changes are the norm. Groundwater in the Middle East is the most water scarce region in the world are becoming to face this water crisis and to be insolvent in face of the increasing demands, climate change, coupled with inefficient policies that take into account nature-based solutions. If the Arab region is to adapt to climate change, our policies and the practices should be based on three requisites for sustainable groundwater under climate change. First, Bumming should be less than recharge and average. Second, conjunctive use with surface water. Third, artificial recharge and recovery. So some instant comments over there as to how we can implement these. And we want to know how this is applied generally in the MENA region. Are there some examples? Are there some experiences? What are the key things? The Middle East and North Africa has many good projects on nature business solutions that need to be doubled with good governance and the financial sustainability. Among the promising adaptation opportunities, managing aquifer recharge projects, which has several benefits, including storing water for future, reducing losses, managing saline intrusion, and enable reuse of waste and storm water. So my main message is that business as usual is not the op an option for us, and we must adapt to climate change with five C's. Coherence and the integration, cooperation, co-financing, capacity development and building and the institutional development and the communication and digital transformation. So these fives are an important takeaway and I am hoping that the message from these five C's should be taken up to the to the governmental levels. So here we are. Uh, there are some several messages we want to give. Some of these state that groundwater is available. It uh, it's, it's visible. It's resources that support cultivated lands, wetlands, biodiversity, and this unfortunately is a resource that seems to be still a little bit out of sight and thus a little bit out of mind of the decision makers. And so, in the name of the future generations, what we'd like to say as a message from here to the COP generally and to the ministers and to the stakeholders is, let's steward them wisely, else, unfortunately, foolishly, we may lose the resources and that may not be a very good thing. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you very much, Jamie and Karen as well. As we move to close our session, um, just like to reflect on the many links that we heard between water availability and biodiversity and how they can be used for climate change. Nature-based solutions are very multifaceted solutions um, and provide multiple benefits across an ecosystem and system. Um, there are many co-benefits here and they're also very adaptive as well. One thing we heard from many speakers is that how important collective action is. Everyone is needed to advance the implementation of nature-based solutions and have buy-in across the community. 
I would like to now turn it over to Yerker Tamerlander for some closing remarks and a call to action. Yerker is the Director of Science and Policy at the Secretariat of the Convention on Wetlands. He leads the scientific and technical review panel of the convention and coordinates policy and capacity building activities in the Secretariat. He has over 25 years of experience working in sustainable development, environmental protection, and climate change, including as an employee of the UN Environmental Program and IOCN. Yerker, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kari, and thanks to, to all the presenters who have shared so much knowledge, so much experience with you today. Um, achieving water security and adaptation and mitigation really requires harnessing the power of ecosystems, the power of wetlands. And I will remove my mask on this one occasion. Um, since industrialization, we've lost 87% of the world's wetlands. An estimated 35% of wetlands were lost uh, since 1970 alone. And the rate of wetland loss continues unabated almost. Uh, it is far exceeding the loss rates of uh, other terrestrial ecosystems. So with this loss, we do not only lose the ecosystem, we lose the services that underpin our life, our livelihoods, um, that underpin our adaptive capacity, that provide us the water we drink. Um, in doing so, we also contribute to driving climate change. When vast amounts of carbon that has been stored, for example, in peat soils and mangroves and seagrass beds is released into the atmosphere and when we lose the ongoing sequestration capacity uh, of these ecosystems. In this session, we heard examples of solutions, locally developed and owned, addressing immediate local needs, achieving real genuine water and adaptation outcomes, and, uh, and uh, they should really serve a, a source of inspiration and learning here. We heard about constructed wetlands for wastewater management with beneficial use of the treated effluent as well as uh, efforts to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions arising from it. We heard about land use and wetland management to enhance replenishment of aquifers, supporting natural discharge and enabling withdrawals. Uh, we heard about opportunities to combine nature-based solutions with other kinds of interventions in a strategic manner. New governance instruments and approaches that are transparent and inclusive. Um, and put them together. And what they really show is that this can be done. It, it works. These kinds of solutions on their own, in combination, can constitute effective nature-based solutions. So. We need to rapidly bring such solutions to scale for the simple reason that if we don't, we cannot achieve water security. We will not reach our globally adopted climate, biodiversity and sustainable development goals. So I want to emphasize here three points that I think came out of these talks quite clearly as, as needs emerging, uh, the, the sort of catalytic actions that can, uh, can really accelerate implementation. Uh, they are policy, investment and knowledge. And I'll speak briefly to each of them. First of all, policy. Um, this really means making nature-based solutions in wetlands a central part of national and global climate change and water policy agendas. Nationally determined contributions national and sub-national adaptation plans, development strategies, you name it. It needs to get into sectoral plans, whether it's water resources, forestry, infrastructure, agriculture, they belong within these frameworks where they still rely on sectoral eliminations. Um, it needs to entail creating really genuine space for the governance approaches and for the actions required. Uh, genuine space for collaboration across government, private sector and civil society. And, uh, and create space for these hybrid solutions where we really mix different tools to, uh, to address the needs uh, in place. It's absolutely not starting from scratch. Uh, for example, the 172 parties to the Convention on Wetlands have, through decisions of the Conference of the Contracting Parties, encouraged wetland use protection 
and uh, restoration for disaster risk reduction, for uh, incorporation of peatlands and blue carbon ecosystems in nationally determined contributions, etc., etc. So there is already a policy recognition at the global level for this. There's also a wide range of tools developed through the convention, including very recently published uh, policy briefs and the guidelines of the scientific and technical review panel. Secondly, investment. Um, finance is essential to help countries increase ambition in mitigation efforts and to enable adaptation at all levels. At the moment, investment in nature is not really commensurate with the benefits we draw from nature. And uh, by some estimates, uh, the annual investment in nature needs to triple from today's level by 2030 if we're to achieve uh, the outcomes we need. Um, Nature-based solutions are already being quite actively integrated into strategies of uh, bilateral and multilateral development agencies, financial institutions. Uh, we saw here in this session great examples from the GF, for example. But it needs to still increasingly become a core element across strategies, uh, the conventional ones that we tend to speak about the most, but also uh, across uh, sectoral uh, interventions. With a good outcome of this COP26, there may actually be quite a significant step towards ensuring adequate financing for water systems, for wetland-based solutions. Uh, so uh, uh, let's, uh, let's see where we land by the end of this week. At the same time, we have to achieve a conducive regulatory and policy space for investment and for private funding in particular. So that includes support to development of the projects that are truly investment-worthy making them ready uh, so that we can have that triple bottom line and get the much broader funding available within the private sector. Again, there's much that can be leveraged, for example, uh, significant readiness nationally um, or at site level on the basis of the data, the institutional capacities and mandates, the procedures and so on, generated as part of national commitments under international frameworks like the Convention on Wetlands. So, we, if we use those things that are there at the national level, put the bits together in a more strategic way, we can probably also fast track the financial flows more than we have been able to do to date. Um, third is, is understanding, and this is really um, understanding, knowledge, capacity, crucial to achieving the policy changes and the financial investment that I spoke about a moment ago. Um, this needs to continue and develop the knowledge base, but we already have plenty to act upon. And so if we take the knowledge that exists and put it to use, we can take giant leaps for wetlands NBS in the very near future. Um, the challenge here is perhaps to ensure that that knowledge is better distributed. It's, uh, it's exceptionally high in certain um, patches, it needs to cut across all sectors and stakeholder groups in a very different way. And uh, in this case, um, I'm happy to mention a, a training tool that we put out earlier this week together with Danone and WWF that seeks to achieve exactly that kind of broader understanding and uptake. Um, of course, I also want to recognize our international organization partners such as IMI, speaking in this event as well, for all their efforts in broadening understanding and really enabling the change that we need to see. So with that, uh, Kari, I think uh, I have captured what I wanted to summarize from this event. I hope that some of this can lead to genuine action going forward and, uh, and I end there. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much for those remarks. Um, on that note, I will begin to close the session. Um, I'd first like to thank all of the panelists and speakers and those that contributed to this event and thank them for really sharing the diverse experiences and expertise. I'd also like to thank the conveners of this session, of which there are many, um, for their effort in, to organize this event and really capture all these diverse voices. I'd like to thank the Water Pavilion organizers and those for that for Nature Day for creating the space for us to share our expertise. So on that note, as the sun rises in my home in Seattle, I'd like to close the session and wish everyone a very good day. Thank you.